Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 and 6 and 7, the fourth lesson. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Our fifth lesson, taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, Elizabeth, excuse me, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings. You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Let's sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Thank you. 
The sixth lesson, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning all that had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, it's getting dark, and I can't see any longer if you're paying attention. Hopefully, out there in your cars, you have been paying attention, listening to this story, not looking at your phones, not being distracted by whatever's in your cars that might distract you, but hearing this whole story. In this service of lessons and carols, we really get pretty much most of the biblical story, creation and fall, sin and salvation, earth and heaven. And note in this passage I've just read, in verse 1, it begins in those days. This story does not begin once upon a time. 
And it certainly does not begin in a galaxy far, far away. In those days is a phrase that ties this story to history. This story is rooted in history, verifiable historical days. This story, the biblical story, is a record of divine activity in historical time. And it is an accessible record. You do not need special training to hear and know the story. Just read the book. You do not need advanced degrees. You only need to read the book. You do not need to buy expensive seminars. You only need to read the book. Yes, read thoughtfully, read faithfully, even read with a critical eye, but read. Read this story of God's activity in our world, in the history of humankind. Read and know deeply. Read with faith that what we read in our Bibles is reliable. Read with faith in God, whose actions in history are recorded for us here. Read this story tonight of when God broke into the world in the most personal way, relating to us as one of us. It's important to know and remember that God does not break into the world as an emperor or world leader. God does not come into our world the child of the most well-established. Instead, he enters our world the child of a humble young couple from an out-of-the-way village. And when God arrives, he is announced in extraordinary ways. The announcement is made to shepherds living outdoors, really the poor who are on the margins of society. Of course, this story of a Savior born to the world is important to all people in all times, but also from, very, from here at the very beginning, on through the ministry of Jesus, and into the ministry, hopefully, of Jesus' church, there is a special preference given to the poor. Mary sings of it in the Magnificat. And Jesus, in a few chapters in Luke's Gospel, will announce it in his first sermon, Good News to the Poor. And tonight, the story is of poor shepherds, really those who were on the lowest rung of society, not far above, just barely above, tax collectors and sinners. God's preference for the poor, and gratefully, thankfully, Carpentaria Community Church maintains a continuity with Jesus' arrival and ministry in reaching out and trying to grow in reaching out to our local poor and homeless and those far away from us. And that is a ministry that we should be proud of and continue to encourage. Because God seems always to have an eye out for the outcast. God seems always to be on the lookout for the stranger, the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the prisoner, the lonely, the isolated, those who need help and even more need love. Perhaps we can appreciate that sensitivity of God's for the lost and lonely a bit more this year. So many of us have experienced separation from loved ones because of the pandemic, separation from many because of the pandemic. And here we are, Christmas Eve, and Christmas is, of course, a time for gathering. But this year, many, if not most of our gatherings, are either not happening or happening in a distinctly incomplete manner. Even look at us here in the back parking lot of the community church, not in our sanctuary, 
decorated for Christmas, but doing our best here because of this pandemic. And so perhaps we notice more acutely who we miss this Christmas, who won't be with us tonight or tomorrow. And we do long to be together with those who we can't be with. In some years, our gatherings are incomplete because of geographical distance. In some years, our gatherings are incomplete because of, well, relational distance, estrangement, conflict, misunderstandings, hurt. And this year, added to all that, we have this coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, and we all want badly to be together again, safe and whole and together. And this story tonight of God breaking into human history is really because God wants the same thing. To be together, to be reunited with those who bear his image. Imago Dei, the image of God. The lessons tonight remind us we have come from the good of creation to the fallenness to God's promise to rescue and save. And all the tragic and painful and unjust personal stories, let alone historical stories, of man's so-called inhumanity to man that stretch all the way down to the roots of the tragic breakdowns and breakups of the foundations of human society. Families. Of course, there are bright spots, for the image of God and people is durable. There is kindness and love and care. Yet if we know ourselves, let alone the history of our race, we know how fickle we as individuals can be and how easily we are led into all manner of temptation to lesser behaviors and choices uncharitable thoughts, outright conflicts, and all the rest. As I said last Sunday, it takes personal humility and honesty to admit to ourselves and to God that we need a Savior. And the story tonight that we remember is that today a Savior has been born to you. The announcement is made to marginal shepherds, to the poor who God ordains to be the first human heralds of his good news. And ironically, the announcement is made by an army marshaled for action. Ironic because the army of the Lord's angels is not fitted for battle, but for praise and the announcement of peace. In verse 13, we hear of this great company of angels, and the word is stratia, it is a military word that describes a collection of army units. It is an army. And this angel army is mentioned again later in the story of Jesus. You will recall it. Let me remind you of the other time we hear about this angel army at the other end of Jesus' life. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs?
to capture me? The angel army shows up at both ends of this story. God does not send Jesus to storm the world by force, but to love the world back into the family of God. The loving promise of a God who longs to be reunited with us and bless us with a remade world. The love and longing of this Savior born to us today, the Savior who in love gives his life for you and me on the cross. And there on the cross echoes this angelic announcement about today. Today for you something happens. And even from the cross, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, a Savior is born to you. God longs for you. God loves you. God gave his life to save you and to bless you by invitation, not coercion or fiat or force, but by invitation to personally receive the Savior born, born for you, to die for you, to forgive, and to restore you. You know, it's it's funny how sometimes the story of God's love can just keep unfolding. And it unfolded again for me this week. Just the other day as I was preparing for tonight, I realized, oh my gosh, there's another service like this service of Lessons and Carols. In the church year, when we have these services that mark the story, it's not just Christmas and Easter. There's a whole church year that we we go through the story to remind one another. And there's another service once a year where we read and remember pretty much the whole story. And it's the service that we hold on Holy Saturday or the Easter Vigil. From the day of his birth to the day he was dead, we remember this whole story. The day after Good Friday, the day before Easter. Last Sunday, I encouraged us to learn a lesson from Mary. To say yes to God. When God comes to your heart, to say in faith, may it be to me according to your word. And now tonight, let's learn a second message from Mary, a second lesson to treasure this story, to protect it, to tell it, to think on it, to ponder and ruminate, even to wrestle with it and all of its implications for us and for the world. In the battle to win you back to God, Jesus gives his life as a child, and later Jesus gives his life on the cross to save you and to save me, and and that's a good place to move to a celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so I'll invite ushers, now in the darkness, to go over behind the bell tables and to to get the baskets full of communion elements and all come over to the table and begin to describe how we will share communion tonight. The ushers have baskets, and in those baskets there are individual communion cups, a small cup of juice with a small wafer on top that you can Peel off and have both together. They also have 
little jars of cran grape and some Hawaiian sweet rolls and some small cups. And so if you have not brought your own supplies for communion, your own bread and fruit of the vine, which many of you bring, then as the ushers move forward throughout the uh, parking lot here, just flag them down and they'll give you what they have. And uh, I guess I'll need for them to give me a sign that it's distributed because it's pretty dark out there. So as the ushers move, let us prepare our hearts for this, this remembrance of the Lord's Supper. I still see movement in the parking lot. I presume those are ushers moving about. And if one of you would walk forward when you're done and let me know that you've made it through the whole parking lot. We've learned many things on the Sundays, this pandemic and having the drive-in service. Hopefully we won't be out here next Christmas Eve, but if we are, we'll make sure that there's little portable lights on all those ushers' baskets and plates to help them in their, in their service to us tonight. Okay, I see ushers returning to their seats, so let us carry on. We have now this whole story. Jesus born today, a Savior is born to you. And we know that on the way to the cross, Jesus was gathered with his most loyal, his closest friends. Yet those who would soon betray him 
And as he gathered with them that evening for that last supper, he took bread and he broke it and gave it to them, saying to them, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. And surely they did not understand or grasp all that he was saying as he poured a cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this remembering me. And tonight, as we share the bread and the cup, we enter into a moment of God that is outside of time. As we share and remember, we, we share in a proclamation of the saving death of the risen Son, a proclamation that has been continuous for the whole history of the church, will one day come to an end when he returns in glory. May God bless this communion. Let us pray. We are grateful, God, that you sent your Son. We are grateful for Mary and Joseph for raising him faithfully. We are grateful for Jesus' own obedience. for his life and ministry and teaching, his witness. But most of all, God, we are grateful for his sacrifice on the cross to die a death for us, to give us something we could not earn or gain, that we would have something that we cannot lose. God, unite us with us and with one another in this communion meal. We ask you to bless this bread and this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name, amen. You are invited to share the bread and the cup there in your cars or your seats, and Mike and I will as well up here on the rooftop. Our seventh and final lesson taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Amen. We come to the last movements of our service, and it's time for our candle lighting. And usually at this point in the service, I have a whole thing I'm asked to tell you it's in order to keep wax off the pews in the sanctuary. And tonight, of course, there are, there's no danger of that. Instead, just an encouragement, please keep those candles held far out your cars so you don't have any wax spilled in your car. And so there's no flame in your car either. There are ushers who have, they have fire, they have lighters, and they are going to spread throughout the parking lot. And if you would just hold your candles out your windows, they will light those candles. And pretty soon we'll see a lot of candles hopefully held out of the cars. And we will know that we are just about ready to sing Silent Night together tonight by candlelight. So ushers, you have your lighters, make your way both sides of the aisles and let us light these candles. And of course, be careful when we're through to blow them out and hold them outside your car long enough for the wax to harden a little bit and then take them home with you as a memento of this evening. I want to get out your camera and this is looking pretty neat from up here, <laughs> all these lights. We're getting close. Looks like just a few more in the middle. Okay, Ron, I think you're, you've got the green light to begin Silent Night. Thank you. 
You are encouraged. Encouraged to ponder and treasure this story. Especially in the joy tomorrow as you gather, as you celebrate, and as you give gifts to one another on Jesus' birthday. And as you long to be together with those who you miss, remember that God longs to be together with you and with me throughout the year, throughout our lives, that we might extend the invitation to believe to others, that all might enter in to life as children of God. May you be blessed this Christmas. May God help us through the rest of this winter. May God bring relief and peace to this world. And tonight, we end the service by saying, the church says together, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Amen. Yeah. Be very careful as you drive away. Turn your lights on and Merry Christmas to you.